Mr. Kok Hing Lut. Thank you, Deputy, Deputy Speaker, sir, for allowing me to uh, respond to the President's address. First, I would like to thank the President for that address. And I think uh, through that address, I have heard many in the House spoken about inequality and the urgent needs to address the growing gap between the wealthy and the less privileged. But let me start by reading an excerpt from a book that has uh, greatly influenced my own theatre practice, which I feel we can learn a lot about a lot from. The book is Pedagogy of Hope, written by Paulo Freire, who is a Brazilian pedagogue educator. In the book, Freire recounts a talk that he did for workers about freedom, authority, punishment, reward, and dialogical education based on his own research and few studies on the ground in Brazil. During the talk, Freire argued for a dialogical loving relationship between parents and children in place of violent punishments, especially amongst the underclass. After his talk, a man, aged about 40, looking very worn out, asked to speak. After he praised Freire for his nice words, which, represent, which presented complicated ideas in simple terms, he posed a question to Paulo Freire. I quote the question. Dr. Paolo, sir, do you know where people live? Have you ever been in any of our houses, sir? And then this man began to describe their houses, the lack of facilities and extremely minimal space within which the families must cram into. He spoke about how lacking they were in basic necessities. Freire had visited these houses but never lived in them. Then the man asked another question. Doctor, I've never, see, I've never been over to your house, but I would like to describe it for you, sir. Then the man started describing Ferry's houses, complete with his amenities, running water, rooms for his, for his children and his personal needs, and so on. These are the same amenities that the man himself doesn't enjoy, but which Ferry has become accustomed to. Then the man said, Now, doctor, look at the difference. You come home tired, sir, and I know that. You may even have a headache from the work you do. Thinking, writing, reading, giving this kind of talks to help us, like what you are given now, you have given now. That tires out a person too. But sir, it's one thing to come home even tired and find the kids all, ba all bathed, dressed up, clean, well-fed, not hungry. Yet it is another thing to come home and find your kids dirty, hungry, crying and making noise. And people have to get up at 4 in the morning the next day to start all over again, hurting, sad, hopeless. If people hit their kids and go beyond bounds as you say it, it's not because people don't love their kids. No, it's because life is so hard, they don't have much choices. It was a sobering sharing for Ferry, but Ferry felt he was very misunderstood. So he complained to his wife, but his wife in response said, Could it have been you, Ferry, Paolo, who didn't understand them? They understood you, but they needed to have you to understand them. There are two issues here. Firstly, it's really very difficult to acknowledge that one is in a privileged position whether it is white privilege, Chinese privilege, class privilege, male privilege, and so on. To acknowledge it would mean that you're admitting that you're, you are where you are at in life, not solely because of your merit, but because your privilege has, knowingly or otherwise, helped to get you to this position. That knowledge might make us indignant, especially if we have if we were never conscious of our privilege, let alone think that it is part of why we are successful. We cannot talk about inequality without first acknowledging that some of us are more privileged than others. And if we want to address inequality, we must acknowledge the systemic factors that allow for unequal distribution of resources and opportunities. 
must think deeply about how we have all, in some way or another, contributed to the persistence and growth of inequality. Hence, is it accurate when we say that meritocracy is the way to help keep inequality in check? I do not believe so. In fact, the social stratification we see in our midst only remind us of the imperfection of meritocracy. Meritocracy must not be an end in itself, to itself. Rather, I believe that it is merely one of the means to a greater end. So what is this greater end? It is to ensure that Singaporeans and anyone living and working in Singapore are given respect and dignity as an individual being. By that, I mean respect for his or her emotional, spiritual, physical, social and political well-being. And to achieve this, mere economic policy will not be sufficient. We need a cultural shift to think about things humanistically. I think that all of us sitting here in this house would admit that we are the privileged today. Even if some of us may have come from a less than privileged background. In fact, we may even use ourselves as, as an example of how meritocracy can work. We might say, if I have made it, then others also can or will. Yet the statement like that does not acknowledge that each of us face different challenges, which may affect the options we have and alter the paths we can take in life. So how do we discern these differences? I've talked about vulnerable listening in my last speech I made during the budget debate, and here I would like to add one more quality to that, to look at in the way we behave culturally. Paulo Freire, through his experience, developed an approach on how to work with the underclass, the people who are oppressed. He said that one needs to listen with compassion, and importantly, one needs to be humble when listening. As we listen, we need to know that we hold positions of privilege. We need to acknowledge that knowing the facts or being intelligent does not mean we can solve all problems and offer good solutions. To take a recent example, in trying to save Ellison Building from being demolished and then rebuilt again, various civil society and heritage experts came in to offer solutions. URA and LTA agreed that they would need to listen deeply to be more attentive to the needs of all parties and acknowledge that they may not know the best solutions. Through these negotiations, I'm glad we have come to a good decision for the future of Ellison Building. Good leadership is about humility. Being a good leader is not about showing how visionary you are, but about letting people be part of that visioning process. Lao Zi in Tao Te Ching or the way, has this wise word for leaders. To paraphrase, one should not be prejudicial or you will lose your objectivity. With humility, one can entertain and allow for greater possibilities and discoveries. At the same time, we as people must be critical citizens so that we can demand for good leadership. In fact, I would even go as far to say, without good and critical citizens, we will not be able to get good and responsible government and leader. Governance is not just about what we expect of the government, but what we also demand of ourselves as citizens. We should not just think that our rights as citizens is merely about voting in the leaders. As critical citizens, we must be able to express our views about issues of concern. We should be able to engage in discourse with reason, passion, humility, and empathy. Discourse among people between different sectors or between people and leadership should not be about winning arguments or about flushing out the other views. It is not about shaming, name-calling, or bullying. Rather, this course is about understanding and learning to live with the others. We have acknowledged in this house many a times that the world we live in is getting increasingly more diverse. In fact, instead of saying that we are now living in a world of us versus them, majority versus minority, I would say that we are living in a world that is made up of disparate minorities. 
we must look toward the heterotopia, a space for all that embraces these differences we have. But there is a trade-off in this. Maybe we will, have, we will be less efficient in managing all these differences. But I strongly believe that efficacy is more important than efficiency. We cannot just simply invoke this often used mantra, agree to disagree, so as to expedite decisions. We need to find a time and a way for us to listen to and understand each other long enough so that we are able to agree to disagree meaningfully. And then our disagreement will still resurface. But when, that, when they happen in future, these differences will not be contentious because we have listened with compassion, because we have not assumed that our privilege gives us the ability to offer all the right answers every single time, because we know that through this long engagement, we will build trust. In this way, we can address disagreement with empathy and generosity. Thank you.